want to leave me, leave me to rest. Oh Lord, won't you leave me, leave me to rest. We welcome those who are in our building this morning and also those who are worshiping with us via Zoom. We hope that all of us will be inspired and encouraged to live godly and righteously in this present age. This morning we have Stephen Grenell to lead our song service this morning. Interesting enough, he's leading our song service and his birthday. And um, we know that he will be singing joyful songs. Uh, there is a young lady that is also here visiting with us. Today is also her birthday. So she's privileged, Stephen would say. But we are delighted to have everyone with us this morning. So let us truly worship God in the spirit and in the truth as we seek to magnify his mighty name. So without any further ado, I call on Stephen Grenell to lead us in our song service. Good morning, everyone. I trust that we are in high spirits, that the past week wasn't too rough on us, and that even if it was, that we'll find respite in today. Um, we have a wonderful sermon set up for you this morning, and I promise that I won't keep you too long because it's going to be as sweet as the singing, it's going to be as powerful as the prayer, it's going to be as lovely as the Lord's Supper and it will be a gift to us all this morning. Yes, I'm going to ensure that you are as ecstatic in preparation for said sermon as I am. I want you to turn your songbooks with me, the song where right, it disappear. Song number 525, five. just hold it there for me. I'm going to sing one chorus, and then we're going to jump straight into our hymnals for this morning. And I want us to think on the concept of gifts as we prepare for this morning's message. And I decided in selecting the songs that I would allow some of my closest friends, because I feel like one of the greatest gifts is friendship, I allowed them to tell me the songs that I was going to sing today. So the songs that we'll be singing from our hymnals are some of the favorite songs of some of my closest friends. We're going to sing one chorus and then we'll get into it. We are together again, just praising the Lord. We are together again in one accord. Something good is going to happen. Something good is in store. We are together again. We are together again. Just praising the Lord. Just praising the Lord. Bright land beyond. Land beyond where is no. Where is no night. Summer land. God is its light. Oh, happy summer land of bliss. Amen. You may be seated. Shout out to PJ for that song. Good morning, everybody. It's surely good to be here this morning. So good to see so many people out this morning. It almost feels a little like how it was before the plague hit us. I want to thank Brother Grenell for giving me this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you from the scripture. And I want to thank Brother Devereaux for, for taking on the challenge of reading those three scriptures this morning. 
In our first scripture reading this morning from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, we see that after God spent six long, hard, tiring days creating the heavens and the earth and all that lay within them, on the seventh day he rested. In our second scripture reading in John chapter 17, verses 4 to 5, we see Jesus talking to his disciples. He's coming to the end of his journey here on earth. He just in chapter 16 about the death that he was about to endure. He's looking to the end. He's looking at all that he has endured and he tells you, I've endured all that this cruel world has thrown at me and I've accomplished the task. I've glorified you. Now glorify me. In our third scripture reading, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, we see the Apostle Paul reminding us that we should be imitators of God. So brethren and friends, how do these three passages tie together? Well, this morning I want to focus on a principle that underlays both of the texts in Genesis and John. The principle, principle being that after you have worked hard, after you have accomplished something, after you, you have endured something tough and have survived, you deserve a reward, a gift of some sort. After creating the world and seeing that it was good, God rewarded himself with rest. After accomplishing his task here on earth and enduring minds on things above, not on things on the earth. For your died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Brethren and friends, a changed perspective, a praise-filled perspective starts with a pause for praise, but it continues with us consciously and continuously, purposely and persistently elevating our thoughts. First, we lift our eyes to God in praise, and then we keep our minds and our thoughts elevated. We set our minds on things above, not on things of the earth. We set our minds on God and on Christ. We focus on, our, on the fact that our lives are hidden with Christ in God, and we look forward to the hope that we will also appear with Christ in glory at the end. Brethren and friends, we ought to work at ensuring that our praise changes our perspective as we go through each and every day. But, but, but someone is looking at me this morning and saying, David, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what my days are like. It takes everything out of me just to survive. I can't have my head up in the clouds. I'm sorry but I have to be grounded in reality. And when you say this to me, I'm re reminded of the Apostle Paul, who speaks of this praise-filled perspective while being persecuted, while in prison, while uncertain about the next day whether it will bring execution or release. The Apostle Paul explains that he was able to survive all of this because of his perspective, because his viewpoint was on his God and not on his problems. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 to 18, a passage that we're all familiar with, Paul describes this perspective to us. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Hear this now. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. How? How, Paul? How have you been able to endure all of these things without losing hope? without losing faith. But in verse 10, Paul tells us how. He tells us about a changed perspective that comes from always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. And so when we drop down to verse 16, we see that Paul concludes, Therefore, therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. You want to talk about perspective? Look at verse 17. 
for our light affliction. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. Brethren and friends, if our praise is to produce lasting benefits in our lives, it must also be accompanied by a changed perspective. All right. So those were the two P's of beneficial praise, a pause and a changed perspective. With those two P's, brethren and friends, praise can be a wonderful gift to give yourself today. But that was one of the first gifts. What else can you give yourself today as a reward for surviving 2020, this year of plenty, stress and strife? Well, the second gift that I want to discuss this morning is purity. Purity. And to understand why the gift of purity is so important, I want to start by asking whether anyone here or anyone on Zoom can relate to what David said in Psalm 51, verse 3. Psalm 51, verse 3. Here David is crying out to God from the depths of his heart. And he says, God, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. What about Psalm 38, verse 3 and onwards, when David laments, there is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Verse 6, I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. Verse 8, I am feeble severely broken i groan because of the turmoil of my heart verses 17 and 18 for i am ready to fall and my sorrow is continually before me for i will declare my iniquity i will be in anguish over my sin brethren and friends have you ever like david been in anguish over your sin. The weight of sin, brethren, is one of the heaviest burdens that we can bear. That's why Jesus died on the cross, so as to release us of that burden. He died so as to cleanse us of our sins, so that we would never have to carry that burden ever again. Jesus' blood was shed on the cross of Calvary so that you and I could be freed from the back-breaking burden of guilt. That is the amazing gift of grace that we have received from God. So why do so many of us as Christians still bear the burden of sin on our backs? Why do so many of us struggle to experience the joy that should come with salvation? Why do so many of us find it so hard to lift up our heads, to lift up our hands and smile and praise God freely? without any reservations. It's because, brethren and friends, many of us are still bearing the burden of sin. Many of us are still shackled in the chains of sin. And the guilt is suffocating us because we know, we know that Jesus already suffered and died to free us. We have received this gift of grace. We know that we no longer have to be slaves to sin. We know that if we but resist the devil and submit to God, that Satan will flee from us. We know these things, brethren. But yet still we keep on falling. We keep on failing. We keep on walking into the same traps over and over again. And every time we fall and we're about to drown in the mire clear and we call out to God, we feel like such hypocrites. We feel like such failures. We know that God will forgive us, but can we, should we forgive ourselves? When we know that we're like to do it all over again when the devil comes back at us. So we walk around with a guilt that stifles our joy. Because sin is always present with us. We have either just committed it or have just asked for forgiveness for it. 
Purity for some of us, brethren, is a foreign concept that we read about, that we wish for, but we really haven't experienced it for any prolonged period of time. So instead of facing our daily struggles with power and joy and peace and the assurance that comes from knowing that God is with us, instead of that, we face our problems with the added burden of guilt and fear and always wondering whether this will be the day that God gets tired of my pretense at repentance and leave me to fend for myself. In my habitual sin, in the sin that so easily besets me, have I crossed the line from just committing a sin to actually living in sin? Brethren and friends, I don't know if I'm the only one who feels like this or if I'm the only one who asks these types of questions. But what I do know is that I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the guilt and shame. I am tired of the burden of sin. And I'm tired of being tired. I know that I will never be deserving of God's goodness, of his mercy, of his love, of his grace. But do I always have to fall so short? Do I always have to disappoint him and disappoint myself? Brethren and friends, this is my birthday on Tuesday. And the genesis of this message came a few weeks ago when I was sitting and reflecting on my 45 years of life. Yes, 45 years. 45 years of carrying this burden of sin and guilt. And I decided then that I was going to give myself a gift for my 45th birthday. I decided, Brother Kirk, that I was going to enter this 46th year of my life being pure. No more excuses. No more slip-ups. No more walking into traps with my eyes wide open. I am not entering my 46th year with that besetting sin on my conscience. Purity, brethren and friends, is my gift to myself this birthday. And I'm encouraging you to give yourself the same gift. Amen. Christ has already cleansed us with his blood. It is now for us, as the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 11, 12 and verse 1, to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares or besets us and let us run with endurance a race that is set before us. I me, David Tennant, I must choose to lay aside that sin which so easily besets me. It is up to me. Having received God's grace through baptism, having been freed from the chains of sin, it is now up to me to walk away from it. I have been equipped and empowered by God. The devil no longer has power over me. Now it is only my evil desire, my sinful mind that has me trapped. And I have to fight the battle against myself. Brethren and friends, the gift that I'm going to give myself this year is a proper fight. A proper battle once and for all against my besetting sin. Purity is my purpose this year. And I encourage you to give yourself the same gift. But, but, but what some of you may be saying now, but David, didn't I hear you saying the same thing last year? And the year before that? What's going to be different this time around? Some of you may even be thinking, been there, done that, and I still keep falling. What now? What now? Good questions. And to be honest, I don't know. I don't know if I have the answers. I can only share with you what I will be trying. Again, two Ps. The two Ps of purity, if you will. Passion and partnerships. Passion and partnerships. Passion. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 to 2. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 to 2. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite. Matthew chapter five and verse 29. 
If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for one of your members to perish and for your whole body to be cast into hell. Genesis 39 and verse 9. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? Passion, brethren and friends, passion is a strong and barely controllable emotion. We're passionate as people about a whole heap of things. Some of us are passionate about our sports team. Some of, us, some of us are passionate in our feelings about Trump. Some are passionate about racism. Some are passionate about the abuse of children. Others of us are passionate about equal rights and justice. But brethren and friends, how many of us have a passionate desire to be pleasing to Christ? How many of us are passionate in our pursuit of purity? How many of us, brethren and friends, passionately hate sin, and in particular, that sin that so easily besets us? Have we ever thought about putting a knife to our throats, if that is what it would take to conquer our appetite? What about plucking out our eye or chopping off our hand? And I know, I know it is probably figurative language, but doesn't it serve to show us the extent to which we should be willing to go in our battle against our besetting sin? That's right. That's right. Brethren and friends, if I am to be honest with myself, I must admit that my past attempts at resisting my besetting sin have been lukewarm, short-lived. I can't say that I have been passionate about pleasing God in this respect. I can't be honest with myself and say that in respect to my besetting sin, I have been passionate enough to say, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? Brethren and friends, sometimes we treat our besetting sin like how we treat COVID-19 instead of treating it like how we treat cancer. I'm going to repeat and I want us to hear this. Sometimes we treat our besetting sin like how we treat COVID-19 instead of treating it like how we treat cancer. Like COVID, we try to learn how to live with our besetting sin instead of cutting it out and zapping the area with radiation and chemotherapy in a bit to ensure that it never ever comes back. Brethren and friends, sin is a cancer that prevents us from receiving the gift of purity. And we need to be passionate in our desire to root it out. We need to be passionate in our hatred and disgust of it. We need to be passionate about pleasing God. Can't defeat a deeply rooted sin, a habitual sin without being passionate about it. We know, we know that lukewarm efforts will get us nowhere because we have been there and done that. So the question is, are you ready now, brethren and friends? Are you ready now in your passionate, to be passionate in your pursuit for purity? But, as you well know, passion alone won't do it. Some of, some of us have tried this passion thing before. We've gotten ourselves all riled up and ready and rearing and bubbling and excited. Or to fall and sink even deeper than we did before. So what else do we need to add to our passion? We need to add the second P. The second P in our pursuit of purity, and that is partnerships. Partnerships. Partnerships with whom, you ask? Well, we should form the same partnerships that Jesus did when he was faced with his temptations. Question. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, was he alone? When Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, was he alone? Let's look. Luke chapter 4 and 1. Luke chapter 4 and verse 1. The Bible said Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Brethren and friends, Jesus didn't face his temptations alone. The Bible says that he was filled with and led by the Holy Spirit as he went into the wilderness. Brethren and friends, the problem is that many of us 
Many of us face the problem that when we are about to go into our own wilderness experience, we are going without being filled with the Spirit. We are going without being led by the Spirit. Jesus went into a period of great temptation. After having fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, his belly was empty, brethren and friends. But he was filled. He was filled with the Spirit. And because of that, he was able to resist the devil's best shot by saying, It is written. It is written. Brethren and friends, Jesus was Spirit-filled and Spirit-led because his mind was filled with the Word of God. We need a partner when we battle the devil, brethren and friends, because our strength alone won't do it. God has provided us with his spirit through the word of God to equip us with what we need for this battle. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? In the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the spiritual, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit of the spirit, which is the word of God. Brethren and friends, in our battle against our besetting sin, God is our partner. And he has equipped us and empowered us with his word, with his spirit, with his armor. And we need to put on that armor. Too many of us keep on going into a gunfight with the devil armed only with a butter knife. We go into the battle with the devil with our plans and our schemes and our intelligence and our logic. And time and time again we fall because we are play play fighting and the devil is shooting to kill. Yeah. Have we properly armed ourselves for the battle against our besetting sin? Are we truly partnered with the Spirit? Are we truly filled with and led by the Spirit as Jesus was when he entered the wilderness? But that was just the first temptation of Jesus. That came at the start of his mission here on earth. Can you tell me what was the other really major temptation that Jesus faced, which came towards the end of the mission? Very good. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 38. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 38. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Verse 37, then he came and found him sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Brethren and friends, as Jesus faced the great temptation to give up on his mission, as he stared death and torture and aloneness in the face, he wanted a cup to be taken from him. He wanted not to have to go through this torture. And as he faced his temptation, brethren and friends, did Jesus choose to go through it alone? No. No. He went to get cinema with his disciples. And he told them to sit there while he prayed. And then he took the disciples who were closest to him, Peter, James, and John. 
and he bared his soul to them. Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the Son of God, shared his struggles with these men. Jesus, the Son of God, wasn't too mighty to share with his friends the fact that he was struggling. He wasn't too big to be troubled and deeply distressed in front of them. He didn't stop to say, will they think less of me? He said, Jesus said to his friends, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. And Jesus asked them to stay and watch and pray while he went a little further and fell on his face and anguished with his father. Jesus needed help from his friends as he struggled, brethren and friends. But yet still many of us, many of us are going through our struggles or battles with temptation and sin by ourselves. In our pursuit of purity, we need partners. Not just heavenly partners, but we need flesh and blood partners right here on earth. Partners who can pick up the phone and call us at the time we're more susceptible. Partners who can tell us that we are walking into the trap again and that we're fooling ourselves by thinking that it won't happen this time. Partners who will tell us to stop feeling sorry for ourselves and who will hold out their hands and help us up without judgment, but with correction as we fall and struggle to pick ourselves up. We need partners right here on earth, brethren and friends. And it is sad to say that many of us here in the church have no one that we can turn to for support. Why? Why? Because we're afraid what they would think of us if they knew what we were struggling with. Because we're afraid that they will chat to our business. Because we're afraid that they will disappoint us. But what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do when his friends failed him? He had asked them to stay up with him and watch and pray. And when he returned, he found them sleeping on the job. So what did he do? Did he cuss them off? Did he ditch them? Did he sweat? I will never again ask church people to help me. No, no. Jesus expressed his disappointment in them. He expressed his disappointment in them. But then he asked them to again yes, stay and watch and pray. Amen. And when they disappointed him again, what did he do? Sure, this time he cussed them off. Sure, this time he wrote them off. Sure, this time he struggled on his own. No, he persisted with them and again asked them for their help. Again and again and again. Brethren and friends, the lesson for us should be clear. People will disappoint us. That's right. Just like how we disappoint people. Sure. But we need them all the same. Amen. We need them all the same. And so in spite of the disappointment, in spite of the fear, we still need to try and find partners in the church who can help us in our spiritual battle against our besetting sin. Passion for purity is important, Brother Roman. Passion for pleasing God is necessary, but passion alone is not enough. When the battle gets tough, when our desires rail up, when the temptations strike us from all angles, at those times we need help. And oftentimes God provides that help through other people, through partners in the church, people who will hold us to account. Brethren and friends, purity is a wonderful gift to give yourself today. Think about it. Can you imagine entering 2021 without the weight of your besetting sin? Without that weight of guilt? God through his grace and Jesus through his blood have cleansed us, have freed us from the chains of sin. But it is only we, it is only me, it is only you that can give yourself that gift of purity. My encouragement to us today is to pursue this gift of purity with passion 
acknowledging our need for partners, spiritual and physical, as we battle our besetting sin. So are you ready? Are you ready to receive this wonderful gift of purity today? You deserve it. You deserve it. And it is in your power to give it to yourself today. And the final gift, final gift, wrapping up, that I'd like to suggest to you this morning as a wonderful reward for surviving this tough, tough year is the gift of pardon. The gift of pardon. We've spoken about giving yourself the gift of praise and the gift of purity. So let us wrap up the message this morning by speaking about the gift of pardon. Pardon, brethren and friends, is the action of forgiving or being forgiven for an error or offense. And so since we're talking about giving ourselves the gift of pardon, in this context, I'm suggesting that we give ourselves the gift of forgiving ourselves. We've already spoken about how hard it is carrying around the weight of guilt from besetting sins. We've already spoken about our desperate need to passionately pursue purity. So I don't want anyone to get me wrong here. When I talk about giving ourselves a gift of pardon, I'm not talking about turning a blind eye to our sin. I'm not talking about condoning bad behavior. And I'm certainly not talking about ignoring bad sinful habits. Those were what we addressed in the last point. Here, I'm talking about letting go. Letting go of past sins and mistakes, past trespasses and errors, past times when we have disappointed ourselves and others. Here I'm talking about letting go of the things that happened to you in your childhood for which you still blame yourself. Here I'm talking about letting go of the disappointments that came with opportunities that you allowed to slip through your fingers. Here I'm talking about letting go of the regret that you feel for not doing something that circumstances prevented you from doing. Letting go of the guilt that you feel for not being there for someone else. Letting go of the regrets of the past and looking in the mirror and telling yourself, hey, I pardon you. I forgive you. You did your best. It wasn't your fault. Or alternatively, it was your fault, but now you know better. You have grown. You're a better person now. God loves you, and so do I. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just a sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am, because I need to know. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I think I'm weak. You say I'm held when I'm falling short. And when I don't belong, you say I'm yours. And I believe. Oh, I believe. I believe what you say of me. I believe. The only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. In you, I find my worth. In you, I find my identity. Brethren and friends, some of us need to give ourselves the gift of pardon this morning. Some of us need to claim our identity, our worth as redeemed, blood-cleansed, Jesus bought, stamped and sealed children of God. Brethren, sometimes we need to give ourselves the gift of telling those negative voices in our head to shut up. We need to give ourselves the gift of not comparing ourselves to others. We need to give ourselves a gift of not needing to be the best, the brightest, the quickest, the strongest. We need to give ourselves a gift of not needing to seem like we're perfect. We need to give ourselves a gift of recognizing that life has its ups and downs, but we are more than our lowest lows. We don't have to be defined by the depths that we have sunk to, but rather we are defined by the heights to which God is lifting us. And if anyone is telling us otherwise, We need to give ourselves the gifts of shutting them up or shutting them out as we pardon ourselves and climb onwards on the upward trail. Brethren and friends, let us give ourselves the gift of pardon. Let us allow ourselves to love ourselves the way that God loves us. As I close, you know, there's a song that I play to Sean and Elia over and over again. And I want it played at either their weddings or my funeral, whichever one comes first, because I think the words so perfectly capture what I feel for them. 
but also because I think the words capture how God loves us. It's by a passenger, and it says, How many times can I tell you you're lovely just the way you are? Don't let the world come and change you. Don't let life break your heart. Don't put on their mask. Don't wear their disguise. Don't let them dim the light that shines in your eyes. If only you could love yourself the way that I love you. How many times can I say you don't have to change a thing? Don't let the tide wash you away. Don't let worry ever clip your wings. Discard what is fake. Keep what is real. Pursue what you love. Embrace how you feel. If only you could love yourself the way that I love you. And if you ever choose a road that leads nowhere, all alone and you can't see right from wrong. And if you ever lose yourself out there, come on home and I'll sing you this song. So how many times can I tell you you're lovely just the way you are. Don't let the world come and change you. Don't let life break your heart. Brethren and friends, someone in here or on Zoom this morning, there's someone and life has broken your heart. Too many unkind words spoken. Too many regrets. Too many disappointments. And they have chipped away at you bit by bit. So you find it hard to love yourself, to accept yourself, to forgive yourself. But God is looking at you this morning. He's looking at you and he's saying, if you could only love yourself the way that I love you. God is saying to us this morning, if you love yourself the way that I loved you, you'd look in the mirror and smile because you would know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You'd look into your eyes, the window to your soul, and you'd see that all the guilt and shame and regret of the past have been washed clean and have been replaced by love, by God's love. God is saying to us this morning, if you love yourself the way that I love you, you give yourself the gift of pardon because you would know that I have already pardoned you. Brethren and friends, isn't it time that you gave yourself that gift of pardon? As I close this morning, let me remind us of the three gifts that we ought to give ourselves this morning. First, the gift of praise as we pause to taste and see that God is good. As we purposely and persistently change our perspective as we go through each and every day. Second, the gift of purity as we passionately seek to please God and lay aside our besetting sins, as we speak, seek spiritual and physical partners to help us in the daily battle against our own desires. And the third gift that we should give ourselves is a gift of pardon, as we seek to love ourselves the way that God loves us. Brethren and friends, the message is yours. I'm going to sing a song of invitation now. If the message has touched you in any way, if anything has been said that is applicable to you, if you need the prayers of the church as you decide to step forward and give yourself these gifts, then let us partner with each other in prayer this morning. And finally, if you're not a Christian and you're hearing this message, I beg you to please remember that before you can give yourself any of these gifts, you first have to receive the greatest gift of all, and that is the gift of grace which God freely gave so that you can be saved, so that you can live in peace with him here on earth and through eternity in heaven. God's gift of grace has paved the way for you to be washed in the blood of his son Jesus through baptism in water as you give your life to him. So if you're not a member, if you are a visitor and you want to learn more about the greatest gift of all, please let us know so that we can study the Bible with you. This morning's message has been all about gift giving. So let me end by asking you to give me the gift of your prayers. Pray for me, please. Pray that I will apply these lessons to my life. And please, please pray that for me, that this won't be another grand start that ends poorly, but rather that I will end well and be pleasing to him. Amen. Amen.